Hey yo, what up? I be that sequential geek. Welcome to my channel. I went on a haul crawl last Wednesday. It's Friday right now, the 25th, and a couple days ago went to like four different shops. Just want to get this haul underway. I started off over at Amazing Fantasy and took like 470 West. This is just south of Denver. Like Ken Carlisle and Pierce is Amazing Fantasy Comics. It's a good starting point because if you take Pierce North. That'll eventually come to a T at Bowles Ave. Anyway, you follow Bowles just past Wadsworth, and there's two more comic book shops. Uh, one of them's in a strip mall. It's in like an L shape, so it's on the side that doesn't face the main road. Um, doesn't face Bowles, Bowles Ave. It's called Jeff's Collectible Empire. And then after that, further down on Bowles, on the left side as well, on the south side, is 5280 Comics. And then after that, of course, I couldn't resist going to Vision Comics and Oddities. Which right now... Let's get on with the haul, y'all. What are we? Amazing Fantasy Comics. First up, Rebecca Jordan. Newt. Got that at Amazing Fantasy. They got their own price tags. The bag's in pretty good shape. Some of these, if the bag's good enough, I think I'm going to keep it. Just to have that original shop price tag on there. It's a nice novelty. This is nine dollars. I believe that is a John Bolton cover. Uh, so here we got Rebecca Jordan Newt, sole survivor of LV426, the colony. And, uh, I'm getting this info at avp.fandom.com forward slash wiki. Um, it's a great website to get your aliens knowledge fulfilled. So listen to this information. It's a lot of legacy info going on here for geeking out. You know, Alien, the movie came out in 1979, James Cameron, right? Then he followed up with Aliens with an S in 1986. This is the book, Aliens Newt's Tale, about aliens from 1986, yet... It came out six years later in 1992. It includes scenes that were filmed but got edited out of the original uh, screening of Aliens. Um, previous to this book being released six years after the Aliens movie, uh, there were some people in Hungary that created a comic book based on this. Um, also, uh, what I have here, in 1980... Uh, just before the movie Aliens, an Italian uh, producer just did an unofficial uh, Aliens movie. Some trivia knowledge for you. Well, Dark Horse Comics started in 1986. And then a couple years later, they had the Aliens comic, uh, originally called Aliens Outbreak, written by Mark Verheiden. With art by Mark Nelson. So we got two Marks going on there. Mark Verheiden and Mark Nelson did the artwork. And that's actually the first appearance of Newt, if I understand right. There was a magazine, 64-page crit critically acclaimed graphic novel adaptation of the 1979 science fiction horror film Alien, published by Heavy Metal Magazine in 1979, scripted by Archie Goodwin. It's all the Wikipedia info I'm gaining right now. So I guess you had that in 1979. Some Italian tried to make a movie, unofficial Aliens movie in 1980. Some Hungarians created a sequel to Alien, uh, an unofficial comic book. And then you had the James Cameron movie, Aliens, in 1986. You didn't get a comic book about that movie until six years later, in 1992. Uh, with the John Bolton cover there. And uh, I didn't end up paying nine bucks for it until 2021. There you go, from Dark Horse Comics. So much knowledge from avp.fandom.com. All right, it says it right here. Comic book appearances. Following Aliens, the character of Newt went on to appear in a series of Aliens comic book 
published by Dark Horse Comics from 1988 to 1990 that continued her story after the film, alongside Hicks. In these comics, Hicks and Newt travel to the Xenomorph homeworld in order to combat an infestation that has taken over the entire Earth before teaming up with Ripley to destroy the aliens. Now, however, following the release of Aliens 3 in 1992, right, so this book came out the same year, even though it's about the second movie, Aliens, Alien 3 came out the year as this comic book, uh, 1992, in which Newt perished. So Newt died. And I think at the end of that movie, the third one, after, like an after credit scene where there's no light, it's all dark, you can hear one of those face huggers crawling across the floor. I think they were alluding that there was one still left in, in Newt. Um, it said in that Aliens 3 movie, uh, Newt perished. So the character's name in these stories was altered to Billy. This changed first appeared in the novel Aliens Earth Hive, an adaptation of the comic series Alien. Similarly, Hicks became David Wilkes, while Ellen Ripley became a synthetic version of herself. Subsequent reprints of the early comics also used these altered names, thereby keeping the stories congruous with the film franchise. However, despite their new identities, the characters' backstories were not altered beyond the names of people and places. And so Newt and Billy both share remarkably similar experiences. This is per the avp.fandom.com site. I am reciting. More recently, it's important to note here, Dark Horse has begun reissuing the original, unedited versions of the early Aliens comics, thereby reinstating the character of Newt in these stories and restoring the comic series as alternative sequels to Aliens. But Marvel just reprinted some um, of these Dark Horse Aliens comics, and the first volume includes Aliens Newt's Tale. Word up. Interesting to note for the Aliens geeks out there, in the comic book adaptation of Aliens 3, it was revealed that Newt was originally the one who was impregnated with the embryo of the Xenomorph Queen, but after Newt ended up drowning in her cryotube, the Queen transferred hosts to Ripley. There is also strong evidence to suggest that Newt may have been carrying the Queen for longer than initially suspected, suggesting she may have been impregnated on LV-426, and that the Queen's gestation period took longer due to Newt being in cryosleep. This theory also attributes the existence of two xenomorphs on Fury-161, despite there being only one egg and one facehugger seen. So yeah, like I said, this was uh, the like there were three sets of limited series. Uh, this that was the first, the first series. It was only two issues, and then you had part two, Aliens Nightmare Asylum, part three, Aliens Earth War, which got changed to Female War. But um, that's all. It's a really kick-ass John Bolton cover. Of course, when I see me some of that James O'Barr, I'm gonna, gonna grab it. Yeah, yeah. This first one here on the left, James O'Barr's Tasty Bits, seven dollars and fifty cents. I see these, but not in this level of condition. Um, I think it's just a bunch of pinups. All right.
This is from 1999, by the way. <clears throat> Avalon Communications Corporation, June 24th, 1999. In Montreal, it is a holiday. This is from Roger Broughton, publisher. Nineteen ninety eight. The Crow in a wedding dress. That was referred to at the beginning. It says here, female crow in wedding gown was an unpublished piece to illustrate a suggested movie script for a crow film. The rest of the illustrations were carefully chosen to showcase James' talent as a comic book artist and illustrator. A collection of tasty bits we hope you will enjoy. Sincerely, Corinne. Get the heat turned up. Then in 2001, we've got James O'Barr's Savages. Paid $6 for this. This is really hard to get without his signature actually I do already have a copy of this with his signature and another one that is a bunch of spine ticks but if you'll see we got the back here Never hear much about James Labar. Well, check this out. Up on eBay, I just bought two copies of Philadelphia number 16, cover B. For both of those together with shipping, I paid $13.89. It's not going to be delivered until the first week of August, though. Something to keep your eye out for if you're a James O'Barr fan. He also did, I think it was issues 8 or 9 of uh, Gideon Falls. B cover for that. As far as James O'Barr doing the cover, script, interiors, pencils... I don't know if he's done anything um, much in the past 10 years. If anybody can clue me in, leave a comment. Thank you. Next up. Got ourselves a Jack Kirby. That's right, 1971. This is a blank greeting card, and it's printed by Third Eye, Third Eye Greeting Card. From what I've looked up, like at mycomicshop.com, 
It starts with like number 141 and this is number 164, the last one. Dollar fifty. It's a nice shape. I mean, there's some obviously chipping up there, but if y'all can see that, Marvel Comics Group, Third Eye Incorporated, New York, New York, and then yeah, it's just blank. So. I said, like I said, Amazing Fantasy Comics, they got great back issues. Stuff from all types of eras. Like Batman 3D out of 1990 by John Byrne. Check this out. There's a bunch of pinups in there as well. Um, I mean, from artists ranging from... Ooh, Mike Mignola, Barry Windsor Smith, George Perez, Klaus Janssen, Arthur Adams, Dave Gibbons, Jim Aparo, Jerry Ordway, Mike Zeck, Alex Toth, in addition to the John Byrne story. It's an 80 page story. There's another story from the 15s by Kurt Swan and Sheldon Moldoff. Easy does it. Really nice condition. $35. Nice gloss. Original price, $9.95 USA. Oops. It's from the older story by Kurt Swan and Sheldon Moldov. Some of the pinups. some of the John Byrne story. Introduction by Archie Goodwin. John Byrne, Ray Zone. So that was a good find. That was a decent find. I had to follow it up with one of those old G head shop comics from Amazing Fantasy Comic Shop. And I left with a $16. This is here a Fine Plus VF slash VF 1974 first print. This ran for two issues. The second issue came out. 1977, I believe. So we have a self-portrait of Robert Crumb on the left and his wife, Aline, doing a self-portrait on the right.
Cartoonist Co-op Press, Aline and Bob's Dirty Laundry Comics, 75 cents. Here by Aline Kaminsky Crum, it's a hyphenated last name, and Robert Crum. Dare I say, the great <laughs> Robert Crum. Thank you very much for watching so far. I've got a couple more shops to go to. I uh, just had the whole day snowball. And uh, you know how it is. Just one more book. Oh, when's the next time I'm going to see this again? Oh, I've been hunting for years and I haven't seen this out in the wild in the newsstand. Got to get it. Got's got to get it. Oh, uh, yeah, you know it. Let's finish this up off here. Next shop I went to was... The one that I mentioned that is in the strip mall, it's like if a strip mall is shaped like an L on the side of the L that doesn't face the main road. So this is, like I said, if you're in Denver, you go on Broadway, you turn west on Littleton, that'll eventually turn into Bowles. But anyway, um, it crosses over Pierce, and then you go past Wadsworth, and then on the left, you're going to have this uh, strip mall. And the side of the strip mall is shaped like an L that doesn't face Bowles. You can't see it. It's hard to notice. That's why I'm stressing it. Uh, Jeff's Collectible Empire, they have a shitload of toys. You walk in, it's just like a huge wall, glass and case toys. Uh, they're probably like two-thirds toys, but the third they have of comics, it's no joke. A great back issue selection. They don't carry new comics. They just got a, hundreds of slabs, they said, uh, back from CGC. So... 8966 six West Bowles Ave, Littleton. Jeff's Collectible Empire. So that's some great deals. Yeah, that's some really good deals. 1991. Jim Lee, X Men, issue 10, newsstand. Return a long shot. I'm a big long shot fan. And. When I saw this, uh, you know, I do have the, was it that Marvel Legends comic? Uh, it's not for resale. That It's a reprint of this that comes with a long shot. Marvel Legends toy, figure, whatever. And uh, rarely have I seen this comic in newsstand in, in this nice a condition. I do have a newsstand of this, but the spine's all chipped up. So I'm psyched to get this one. Uh, doesn't hurt to have doubles of... Really dope ass appearance of long shot on the cover by Jim Lee. So that is a cover buy. I did buy that strictly for the cover and for the character based asset uh, for long shot. Uh, that's a two dollar comic. They're saying it's a VG plus. Help me out here on the grading, because I don't see this as a VG plus. Um, is it got a stain on the back, like? There's no spine rule, there's no dents, there's no color breaks. Um, no, that's not a watermark, that's part of the picture. The spine looks great. So they label that a VG. Um, I open it up, pages are white, right? Jim Lee. So, all right. I don't think that's a VG. I think that's a VF. Um, I think that it's a great deal. Is what it is. It's two. It's two dollars. That's from nineteen ninety one. So fifteen percent in nineteen ninety were newsstand. Uh, by nineteen ninety five. 10% renew stand. We got ourselves right here. X Men number 299. New stand. Nice shiny background. Um, I think there's a like gold of this. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, how collectible is this really? I got a VF minus of it. Apparently, it's VF minus. Um, this is the bag. This bag's got some scups on, scrapes on it, but. I got that because it's a new stand. It's from the early 90s. 
It's an X-Men 2099 comic book, which I'm not too into, but I figured if I can get something that's under five bucks as a newsstand a brand like this, I'm hoping to at least break even with it. Um, yeah, I could see also as like a trade bait. We shall see. Because my spending has got to chill. It has got to change. Move on to the next. Very good copy of Grant Morrison's Justice League of America, JLA number one. This is sort of like that new Marvel era. Uh, when I saw this in a newsstand, I couldn't resist. Um, you know, the, the newsstand print run by 2000 was at 5%. Um, 2005, it was at 2%. So here we are with JLA number one, which is actually 1997. Um, you know, I'm, Howard Porter's not bad. I, I, I can't say that he's on the my top 10, but um, for a... Oh, the look of this, the design looks, looks all right. I remember when this came out, it was a big deal. Um, it was one of those comics that I, I was slowly frequenting shops more and more often. It's one of those things you do when when you decide to, to cut off comics or cut something off every every year, every two or three years, you go back into like your, your old haunts. Um, go back into a comic book shop just to see if anything's changed, if anything's gotten better. And I remember, yeah, like... Like around 2000, I saw this and it was up on the wall. And this guy's like, Yeah, there's changes, changes happening at the comic book shop. The, the clerk, the rep behind the counter, he's like, Yeah, you should check that out. And I ended up buying like a direct edition of this for like $16 in mint, but that was around like early 2000s. Here I got me a nice newsstand for $4.99. Um, I don't know why they say VG plus though, cause there is like a slight color break right there, but once again, I don't think it's a VG. Um, corners are sharp. There's no dents or scrapes. So well, like I said, that one was from 1997. Here we go now, 2005, I believe. Ultimates Volume 2, number one. So we're talking a 2% newsstand print run. Brian Hitch doing the art. Mark Millar doing the story. This is the second volume, the first two volumes of Ultimates. It's that new Marvel era. I'm always talking about this renaissance. The big deal about this is, you know, yeah, they did have a low print run. Um like stuff from the from the late 90s, but a lot of the stuff that was coming out the first five years of the 2000s, uh, the concepts that stuck were the ones that these movies, that the success of these franchises is based off of, really. So, um, you know, volume one was the one that used Nick Fury's likeness without his permission and so forth. I think that was an issue number two. So finding any of these Ultimates issues in a newsstand is extremely difficult. Um, I think I need, like... Four more issues from the first volume. I'm going to have a run, a new stand, and one of them is number two, as a matter of fact. Um, but the only copies that I've been able to find a volume two, a new stand, are this first issue here in color. There's a sketch variant, um, but I think for the Ultimates volume two, as far as B covers go, the first one had a sketch variant, the first issue, and then the last issue, 13, had this like white cover. It was all white with the wasp. And this, like, victory pose on the cover. Um, Brian Hitch art. So, I know I have a couple copies of those. And I already have a copy, a newsstand copy of this first issue. Um, I got two more now. One for, what, both for Book 99. Uh, this is VF. This is probably better and fine. I don't know how they grade at this place. But if you want to go to uh, Jeff's Collectible Empire. Out off of Bowles Ave in Littleton. You're going to get some deals then. You're going to get some stuff that's graded a lot lower than I think what it really is. So, um, it's fine with me. It's a legendary epic story. Ultimates Volume 1 and 2. Anyone new to comics, please check it out. Uh, these comics had Brian H. Hart going on, so not all of them came out 
on a monthly basis. Um, this first issue came out in 2005. The 13th issue, the last one in the second volume, came out uh, cover date May 2007. So... In April of 05, this one actually came out on time. We got ourselves a right to uh, the third issue of, Vault of Ultimates, Volume 2. Malar Hitch. Nice new stand copy. In this issue, this is the issue where uh, Captain America was in northern Iraq fighting Iraqis, uh, trying to free up some hostages and successfully completed his mission. And there was this huge uh, concept, some political argument going on about superhuman arms race. Uh, also in this issue, this is when Cap started dating the Wasp and also Hank Pym was building his helmet that he was using to control ants. Classic stuff. I think the last time I was reading comics where I was just following Marvel and just reading comics on a regular basis, following people based on combination of writer and artist, was that period around like 2000 till around 2004, a little bit of five, but um, yeah, I've been spending, when I got back into comics, now I've just been spending on collecting, on investments, on specs, on nice to have, on, well, I gotta have this to fulfill a run, or this is something I've always wanted, and uh, so forth. So that's coming to an end. And now I'm um, liking to go back into just buying some stuff to read and to give away and do some acts of kindness and to just, uh, I don't know, like branch out a little bit more than uh, spending to spend uh, for investment's sake to get it before somebody else does. Because a lot of this stuff is, uh, it, it is rare. Um, and I do want to fulfill. My new Marvel runs, right? So I need just two more comics for the new X-Men run. I'll have actually doubles of new new stand prints of new X-Men. I got to get one more issue of Brotherhood to get a full run of just uh, new stand copies, one through nine. And then, like I said, I got to get four more copies of The Ultimates, Volume 1, get a full run of that new stand. And the early uh, Brian Michael Bendis, Michael Gatos stories, of Alias, um, all those issues are extremely difficult to find in newsstand, especially the early uh, Brian Michael Bendis, Alex Maleev run of Daredevil. So if you see those in probably even just a fine condition of newsstand, you know, if you're into that era, um, there's a lot of stories going on in early Marvel, that, that uh, new Marvel era about identity, with uh, Daredevil's identity being revealed, and the, with the Joe... Was it the John Cassidy artwork on that story where Captain America revealed his identity? And then there was stuff going on with this identity disc story that was just some BS short, um, villain-based uh, limited series short story that really didn't go anywhere. But um, then Civil War came, of course. But a lot of concepts of identity being thrown around. And um, I thought that was interesting because also in this issue, it's the world is um, it's revealed to the world that Bruce Banner was the Hulk. And so they had to leave him on this aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean with a nuclear bomb. Uh, probably a gamma bomb, right? I don't recall if it was anything specific like a gamma bomb, but they left him out in the middle of the ocean. They're going to nuke him for the crimes that he committed uh, in that first story arc of Volume 1. Uh, the second story arc of Volume 1 was that alien invasion. And now we got the consequences, the fallout from Volume 1 going on in Ultimates Volume 2 where... Bruce Banner, you know, obviously he survives this um, death sentence. And that's what leads to the uh, Hulk versus Wolverine. Yeah, that led to the ultimate Hulk versus Wolverine. The Damon Lindelof story. The co-creator of the TV series Lost. All right. So I have one more comic over at this place. Uh, Jeff's Collectible Empire. Hold up. I gotta keep it all secured. This like makeshift like magazines around it and stuff, right? Let's be really careful with it. 
but I did not go into the shop expecting to expend, spend this much money, but I did. And you know how there's like that Kiss comic, Marvel comic, super special? Yeah, in 1977 was Marvel Comics Super Special. Kiss was on the cover. And then issue 16 had the uh, printing of Empire Strikes Back. So Marvel Comics Super Special is different than Marvel Special Edition. Uh, Marvel Special Edition, they had the Star Wars run. They also had a Marvel Special Edition that collected of the Marvel comic. And Roy Thomas is the writer. Jim Novak's doing the lettering, by the way. So this came out in 1977. Marvel Special Edition. Yeah. So big, it won't even fit on your computer monitor screen. I know, right? The greatest space fantasy film of all. So... Checking out the condition of this, I'm just really psyched. Um, I, I think it's fair market value that I got. Uh, there's no stains or color breaks. Show you how nice the pages are. Copyright 1977, 20th Century Fox. All rights reserved production by Marvel Comics Group, a division of Cadence Industries Corporation. Volume 1, number 1. 1977. It says here, covers by Rick Hornberg, excuse me, Rick Hoberg and Dave Cockrum. So many places. The money spending has got to stop. But I am loving it in the meantime. And if I'm going to end it, you know, I do have a copy of this, but it is beat to crap. I remember getting this underneath the Christmas tree. It's Marvel Special Edition. So I just want to go through these next few books real quick. Now, hold up. So the next place I went to, just down the street off of Bowles Ave, is 5280 Comics. These are some great, cheap, affordable finds I got. Now talk about Mr. Boat. Um, I've been spending too much money lately. I won't let myself do it. There's some great deals, though, um, on eBay. For her. Now, what is her first appearance? Is it Death Metal 7? Joelle Jones doing the art. The Jenny Frizen covers of these. I just figured I missed the boat on. I've been spending so much money on um, non-modern stuff that for me to just get the Frizen cover for issues 1 and 2, and then I saw Walmart... Uh, for the um, Joelle Jones cover for, um, I think, the Jenny Frizen comics, 
those covers were like around nine bucks a piece and then $24 for the Walmart um, edition of the Joel Jones cover. It's the same cover, basically. Um, now, is that her first appearance or is it like Death Metal 7 or is it some, uh, some other comic? DC Nation presents Future State number one. Or is it Future State Wonder Woman number one? Or is it like Death Metal 7 or something like that? Uh, what is the... Hook me up. So I got this. This is just a nice reader copy. I got this for 50 cents. Most of these were a buck. So I got this... I'm just going to reread it and give it away. Um, this is the continuation of Star Trek, uh, the original series, that dark alternate universe, I think, where they all have, like, goatees and shit, um, sleeveless shirts. Artwork in this is fantastic. Art and Colors by J.K. Woodward. Lieutenant Yar right there. Yar, sir. It's not bad artwork. Not bad at all. So we get a separate Trek story in here. Yeah, I have the um some of the issues of this um, broken mirror. Excuse me, mirror broken storyline. They also have like an origin of data for this mirror broken story. There's some interesting stuff going on with these uh, Trek comics. All right, so that was a buck. This was 50 cents. It's another new Marvel era comic, actually. Taking some stuff, doing a little bit more out of box, away from the brand identity thinking of superheroes, and some of it's a little bit more edgier than others, but this one definitely is a lot more edgier. It's a serial killer. Hyperion's teaming up with Nighthawk uh, to catch the guy, and he's got this brilliant plan uh, to neutralize him. This is the first part, uh, issue 14. Uh, they finish it off, but, uh, yeah, was that Gary Frank? The fourth issue of this, they, uh, introduce their version of Nighthawk. Now, if I understand correctly, if I understand correctly, this is the first comic book with Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar, out of 2017, free comic book day. This also has a copy of Brian Wood's Brooksland, uh, which got optioned by AMC. It's this woman's on a hundred square mile set of wilderness and planning the secessionist movement. And her husband ends up going to jail. Some type of insurrection going on internally. She tries to deal with, uh, with these people that are planning the secessionist movement and things domino effect from there. So that's Briggsland. Do you think, though, that this is the first time Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar, cat people on another planet? I think this is the first time that they've been in comics. 
So according to James hyphen Cameron's hyphen avatar.fandom.com, they say that the line was unveiled at the 2015 New York Comic Con by James Cameron in a video message. Dark Horse is now part of an associated 10-year partnership deal. The comics will be set, quote, before, during, and after, unquote, the events of the first film. Free Comic Book Day 2017 issue was announced on December 12, 2016 and released in May 2017. The full rollout of the Avatar Comics line was originally planned for late 2017. On February 2nd, 2018, Dark Horse tweeted, More James Cameron Avatar is planned for later this year. We'll announce details when can. This free comic book day event, uh, that was in 2017. Then there's that Sue Tay's path in 2019. Um, so, so, so far, I don't think there's a lot of Avatar mythology canon that's being produced. There's merchandise to be produced, people. So, every time I go to 5280, they got a long box filled with different types of free comic book day comics. I think they probably got like 30 of these left. I always grab a couple, so if you're ever in the area, they got them there. Blade out of 1997. This is not a new stand. This is just a regular direct comic. I just had to get it because it's got Mr. Wesley Snipes on the cover. Just thought it looked cool. And it's definitely when you get somebody like a celebrity on the cover. Uh, you know, people age out of their roles. So successful movie like Blade, the first of Avi Arad's campaign to bring live action superheroes to mass media, uh, to the world. Uh, this this is a classic right here as far as I'm concerned. Long term, I think this would be iconic. So I'm sure that the new Blade movie will pay respects uh, to Wesley Snipes. It'd be cool if he made an appearance. That was for... 50 cents. This one and this one I got for 50 cents. Yeah, 52.80, they've got a few short boxes with some deals. And after that, I couldn't resist. I could not resist. I had to go to Vision Comics and Oddities. Um, Vision Comics and Oddities. What did I get? Spent a bunch of time there chilling out. And then with just three comics, I spent a bunch of money there. Uh, chilling out. Paying the price. How can you chill out, really, in a comic book shop? There is hunting to be done. There are deals to be made. I have got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issues 4 through 8. Uh, number 12, 15, 18, I think it like 30-something. Uh, those later ones solely based on, like, covers, but uh, just dope. The array of indie artists that they got working on these from Mark Book day to Rick Veach. It's pretty outstanding. Freaking historical. I got issue one, the fifth print, four through eight, 12, 15, 17, 18, a couple of 18, actually 24 and 30. I just would really be cool if I could get four through 12. So I just need number nine and 10, and I'll be good. And if I don't get them, you know, this is one of those books for me. I gave myself a period of four or five years to spend some money on comics. I got what I got at this point. Uh, if I can trade for issues number nine and ten or um, take my time seeing what I can get, deals, um, type of discounts I can find at places for those issues. And if I don't get them, I don't get them. I've spent so much money in the past five years that I think it's time to chill out. Um, will that ever be possible? We shall see. We, we shall see. We shall see. I'm sure with the proper uh, technology, and, uh, research, um, advancements in nanotechnology and material science, uh, anything's possible. Word, word, so, so. Oh, yeah. Leonardo, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, number 25. Uh, issue number one. Yes. That is right. Peter Laird cover. December 1986 for that Leonardo Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And this really nice copy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 11. It's a Kevin Eastman cover. 
out of June 1987. Not bad finds. I saw these, I was like, why not? I think this comic, uh, issue 11, is like from the point of view of April, uh, journal entry, and that Leonardo Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle issue here on the left. It's like a event takes place during Christmas where Leonardo, almost dead, dying, it's all bloodied, comes crashing through the window at the end, warning his mates, Shredder's about to come down. How can I follow these up? How about with a little bit of something modern? Got inspired by Kev's collectibles. Shout out to that Star Wars geek, that nerd, Kev's collectibles. But also, you know, I gotta be saying, I, I've been making some really nice acquaintances here up on the YouTubes, and just wanna give a shout out to, to some, some really great channel. Um, Mr. Rigamortis86. Um, big elbow. I mean, those guys uh, seems like a really good group of people. They're into some uh, some mainstream comic books like uh, you know Star Wars, Marvel, DC. But they also got some really great uh, non brand identity based driven or whatever you want to call it. Some out of box. I just uh, probably all that want to check out something new. If you want to check out. Uh, some alternative, uh, branch out a little bit, or maybe something to keep an eye out for when you're going through those cheap Dollar Holla comics or those two dollar me love you long time boxes. You can uh, keep an eye out for something that's non conventional, and if you're not sure what, check out those websites uh, Big Elbow and Mr. Brigham Motor 86 and uh, PhD Zombie. Let me look up that last one, man. I, this guy's probably gonna kill me right now. Um, PGH Zombie? Oh, shit. PGH Zombie. That guy is so cool. He's so chill. He introduced me to check out uh, Mr. Rigamortis86 and uh, I think Big Elbow as well. So this last comic I got right here over at Vision Comics and Oddities. So this is a follow-up of Star Wars Legacy. And I believe it's by the same writer as Star Wars Legacy. The six-issue limited series, Star Wars Legacy War. It has a bunch of plot threads, loose ends, that they all tie together from Star Wars Legacy that ran from like around 2005, 2006, up until um, I think just before this. Uh, this came out in 2010, towards the end. Uh, cover date, December 2010. John Ostrander's the writer. Uh, he did the script and co-plotted with the artist. Uh, this woman, John Dursema. Dursema. Amazing artist. She's got brilliant, eye-catching artwork that makes you want to spend your money. So, Jan Dursema. D-U-U-R-S-E-M-A. Dursema. So Jan rocks on the cover art. I'm uh, not sure why we don't hear much about her recently, considering that you've got artists like uh, Joshua Melton that's upped his game. If you compare his type of artwork from what he did uh, about 20 years ago, that's changed. Um, same thing with like, what's that artist named Billy Tan, I think his name was. He did that X-Men story with Ed Brubaker. And if you compare his artwork, like when he first started off, I think he did the artwork for X-23. That limited series. Um, so, I don't know. This this Jan uh, Durisama, she's some really amazing artwork. Um, way to represent face tat peeps. You too can get a job and be accepted by society. Like this guy, he's just got his two lightsabers just going about his day. Getting his responsibilities in order. Um, like coming back from the dead. 
basically, right? I guess there's this dark Sith magic or whatever technique uh, that allows people to super secret um, uh, art, dark art, Sith art of uh, bringing oneself back to life. Well, he figured it out. So Kate Skywalker kills him in the head. Spoiler warning. You're welcome. Yeah, this is the guy that had that like really crazy badass helmet. I don't know that. That was all super horny, baby. Yeah. That was for twenty dollars. What? A heck of a haul. Heck of a haul. I mean, to go from to go from this to this. I'll leave you on that note. Think about that, all right? <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. Really appreciate your support. As usual, any feedback, especially constructive or praise, will be most welcome. Take care. Have a safe weekend. Peace.